do sit down. Ms. Orr. The Commission, please, as I call Ms. Karen Cox. Ms. Cox, would you go into the witness box? Thank you. Now, Ms. Cox, uh, if you go into the witness box, do you want to take an oath or would you prefer to make an affirmation? I prefer to make an affirmation. Yes, then affirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely declare. 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 I
both legal and non-legal needs in relation to their finances. We also now advise in relation to a broader range of issues like banking problems, other debts like electricity, um, debt management firms, early access to superannuation and importantly insurance. Uh, in 2014, we changed our name to the Financial Rights Legal Centre to reflect that broader remit. Could you explain to the Commission the sorts of services that the Financial Rights Legal Centre provides to consumers? Our key services are our advice lines. So we run three advice lines. The biggest and busiest advice line is the New South Wales answer point for the National Debt Helpline. Uh, the National Debt Helpline operates across the country. Um, it is staffed by financial counsellors in every state and territory, but in New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT, there are also solicitors available to give legal advice to those callers. People call that line when they're struggling with their finances and specifically when they've received some sort of default notice um, from a lender or from a utility provider. Uh, we also operate the Insurance Law Service, which is a national helpline for consumers who are in dispute with an insurance company. 75% um, of callers to that line are struggling with a claim um, on their insurance and the rest are being pursued by insurance companies for debts. Our third and most recently um, started line is the Aboriginal Advice Service and that operates across Australia as well and gives advice to Indigenous people in relation to credit, debt, banking and insurance. What can you tell this Commission about the demographic of people who call the National Debt Helpline? Certainly we get callers from across you know, all demographics and all age groups. Um, the biggest number of callers come in the uh, 35 to 54 age group, um, but we also get a significant number of callers, both older and younger than that. Our casework, which is chosen from callers on the basis of um, need, basically, because we have a very strict intake criteria, tends to be an older cohort, so the 45 to 65 present the largest number, and there's a significant number of people over 65 now in our clientele as well. Um, the background of those people, the, they're predominantly low and middle income people. Uh, for callers, then it's about 33% are on Centrelink. Um, for the casework that we take on, about 56% of people are in receipt of Centrelink um, benefits. Uh, the um, Indigenous callers represent around 3% of callers, but close to 30% of casework now. And we also have probably about 10% of casework are people from non-English speaking backgrounds. Approximately how many calls for assistance did the Financial Rights Legal Centre take in the 2016 to 17 financial year? Just under 25,000 and uh, around 17 to 17 and a half thousand of those were to the National Debt Helpline. Are they related to credit issues? Largely to credit issues. And uh, do you get repeat callers to the National Debt Helpline? We certainly do. We encourage people to call us back. Um, predominantly callers are single one-off calls, but there is a small minority who will call us two, three, even up to 20 times. We can't obviously take on everybody to provide casework assistance. So what we try to do is that those people who we think are able to self-advocate, we will give them some advice on the next step, which might be to contact the hardship division of their um, credit provider and have a talk to them and then to call us back and to do that repeatedly throughout the process while they try to settle their dispute. And of the individuals, individuals who call for advice or assistance, what proportion of those do you take on on a casework basis? Only two to three per cent. And what is the nature of the casework assistance that you provide to that two to three per cent? That can vary enormously. For some people, we might assist them to do one thing, like lodge a complaint with the Financial Ombudsman Service. If we're talking to someone over the phone and they have an urgent problem that needs to be lodged with the Ombudsman and we feel that they don't have the capacity to do that, either because of their uh, literacy levels or their levels of stress at the time they call us, then we may simply help them to do that over the phone and then leave them to deal with the matter through with the credit provider and the Ombudsman. In other cases, we will do more. We might negotiate with a whole range of creditors for a person. We may end up lodging a number of disputes in both the Financial Ombudsman and the Credit um, Industry om and, and Investments Ombudsman. Um, or in very rare cases, we might actually run a matter through the courts. Mm. 
and the staff of the Financial Rights Legal Centre are solicitors and financial counsellors primarily, is that right? That's correct. And how many solicitors do you have? Somewhere between 10 and 12 solicitors. And um, how many financial counsellors? Eight or nine. Thank you. And does the Financial Rights Legal Centre work with or consult with other consumer organisations? We certainly do. We work very closely with the Consumer Action Law Centre here in Victoria, who run the Victorian branch of the National Debt Helpline and also do a lot of similar work. We work very closely with Financial Counselling Australia, the peak body for financial counsellors across the country. Uh, we also work with the Legal Aid Commissions, particularly in our case, New South Wales and Queensland. And we work with Choice and other independent community legal centres across the country. In your statement, you have referred to issues that the Financial Rights Legal Centre has identified relating to consumer credit issues. Can I ask you to explain firstly um, something about the experiences that consumers report to the Financial Rights Legal Centre in relation to home loans? Certainly. Um, we speak to well in excess of a thousand people every year about their home loan. Um, most people call us in the first instance because they're struggling to pay and we will only find out more about the actual loan and how it was initiated if we agree to take those people on and give them further help. When we do take cases on and give people further help, we've identified a number of troubling issues. Um, the first issue I think that's worth mentioning that's across home loans, you know, old home loans, no matter how, what channel they've been initiated through, is a lack of um, questions and verification about expenditure. Um, whereas the income side of things is often done quite well, um, the expenditure side not so well. We tend to find very broad questions about expenditure that aren't broken down a lot um, and the impression we get from talking to people and to looking at the very little information we get from credit providers when we ask for copies of their assessment is that it looks much more likely that a benchmark has been used than that they have looked at the consumer's actual expenditure, which, which can vary considerably from a benchmark figure. Um, there's also very little evidence that expenditure has actually been verified in any way. We find consumers are actually very poor at even assessing their own expenditure um, unless we take them to documents like their bills and their bank statements to look at what the actual amounts are. Can, can you explain to the Commission why it's important that a customer's expenditure be accurately recorded in a home loan application? Uh, certainly. I mean, in order to tell whether someone can afford a loan, you need to look at both sides of the equation. Just looking at their income won't tell you the full story at all. You really need to see what a person's expenses are um, to determine to what extent they're able to afford to keep up with that loan without substantial hardship. Now, that, that was the first issue, I think, that, that you wanted to raise. That was the first issue. The, the other issue that's come up across the board is people who have um, been granted interest-only loans. So we notice this just from calls, not even from the casework that we've done. So in the last two to three years, an increasing number of people who have called us about hardship happen to be on interest-only loans. When we inquire as to why they're on an interest-only loan, there's often no obvious explanation. It's not an investment property. It's just a, you know, a, a standard home loan that someone has used to purchase a home or to refinance. Um, and the reason they're calling us is often because they've been seeking a hardship variation because of some temporary glitch like a loss of a job or a temporary illness and they want their lender to vary their payments and the lender is reluctant to do so because they're already only just covering the interest on the loan, which means that if they drop their payments they will move into a negative equity situation very quickly. What does that mean, a negative equity it situation? It basically means that their house will be worth less than their loan. So you've referred to issues in connection with the use of benchmarks, particularly in relation to customers' expenditure, issue, issues in connection with the granting of interest-only home loans. Are there any other issues that you observe when you look at the cases that are reported to you in relation to home loans? To home loans specifically, um, a little concerned about the size of buffers that are being applied, if at all. People seem to have quite tight 
circumstances for borrowing, which is a worry in a very benign interest rate environment where we all know that sooner or later interest rates will go up. So we're very concerned that bigger problems are going to emerge down the track. We've also seen isolated cases of just really inappropriate lending, not necessarily involving brokers, because I will move to brokers in a minute, and, and they are some, some very strange anomalies, like a, um, a woman who would go in who's, you know, say, 72, um, looking for a $30,000 loan to do repairs to a home. The loan is rejected in the first instance because she's got no way of paying it back. Um, quite a legitimate decision and then inexplicably the loan is granted and it's for $70,000 and it's a bridging loan and when we inquire of the bank as to why that's occurred no satisfactory explanation can be provided. So we do see some isolated instance of that sort of thing um, but it's not terribly common except for with broker initiated loans. And what do you see in relation to broker-initiated loans? Oh, we see a range of problems in relation to broker-initiated loans. Um, those problems involve people being upsold, so people going in with a fairly conservative idea of what they think they can borrow and being assured that they can borrow more than that, um, and then either purchasing a property or refinancing um, into a situation where they have a larger loan than we would have thought was necessary, which generates a higher commission for the broker, but can um, cause hardship for the borrower. Um, the other situation we see is people who are steered into either more expensive loans or loans with more expensive features than they actually require. And sometimes those features are, are things that we think are actually harmful for the person. So um, a, a line of credit loan, for instance, is a dangerous and risky product. And we see people sold loans where we don't see any reason for why it should have been granted as a line of credit as opposed to a principal and interest loan. We see um, situations where brokers choose the lender according to their perceived laxity of their credit assessment processes because they think they can push it through with that particular lender. We see consumers pushed into loans where they are under the impression it was meant to be the best loan available but it was really only one of a very narrow range of lenders that the broker dealt with. Um, at the worst end of the spectrum, we see consumers' details being massaged or even completely falsified by brokers. Um, we've also seen isolated cases of out-and-out -out abuse where a, often a member of an elderly person's family will deal with a broker to obtain a loan that's secured over an elderly parent's home and the broker may meet the elderly person once briefly or not at all um, and yet their the main you know their, their home is at risk uh, are there any other issues that um, you'd like to refer to in connection with mortgage brokers I see that in your statement you've listed a number of issues in connection with mortgage brokers in paragraph 32 I'll just ask you to look at that and see if you've covered the issues I think I have covered most of that. I mean, in relation to co-borrowers, that's a, an increasing problem. As I said, we see it in relation to um, elderly borrowers being signed up as co-borrowers for children. Um, sometimes that's done in a very um, straightforward way in which the, it's parents who are knowingly ha assisting a child to buy a home, but in other cases, it's just um, outright exploitative. And there are situations where the elderly person has been left in dire circumstances as a result of a loan for which they have seen absolutely no benefit. Are you able to say what proportion of the um, people who come to you with issues about home loans are reporting issues in connection with mortgage brokers? <sighs> it's really hard for me to estimate that, but I would say that the larger proportion of problematic home loans we see have been initiated through brokers and that we see people much more likely to be in trouble on broker-initiated loans. All right, could I move on then to issues that are reported to you by consumers um, in connection with car loans? Could you explain to the Commission what the Financial Rights Legal Centre sees in that area? Absolutely. We see a lot of problems in the car loan market. Um, people buying 
cars through car dealerships and sometimes even through brokers who advertise online um, or through other medium and then connect them with the car dealership. Uh, those problems are endemic. I think we're picking up one every couple of weeks at the moment. We, when we talk to our colleagues around the country in financial counselling and other credit legal services, they're all seeing very similar types of problems in the car loan market. Now, the, those problems don't always um, involve the banks or their subsidiaries, but sometimes they do. Um, the problems are that there's some very similar themes. So responsible lending, um, we see more failures of responsible lending in the car loan market than in just about any other segment that we see. We see more instances of outright falsified loan applications um, in the car loan market. Uh, we see in the very low income bracket, we see people who are going in to purchase a car, um, who are sold a car worth five or $6,000, who may then be sold add-on products that literally double the size of that loan. So they will walk out of there with you know, a $5,000 car but a ten, eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 loan because of all the add-ons. And they will then be paying somewhere between 38 and 48% on the whole thing. Um, You're for referring there to the interest rate? I'm referring to the mm. interest rate, yeah, which will apply to both, obviously, the size of the car purchase and the add-on products that are financed into the loan. Um, for in other cases where it's slightly less egregious, then you've got um, still <laughs> consistently the sale of add-on products that we don't think are particularly useful to the consumer and that inflate the size of loans. So a recent one we saw was a $25,000 car with $9,000 worth of add-on. Sorry, how many thousand dollars? $9,000 worth of add-on products on a $25,000 car. Um, so the add-on products do apply across the board, even to the more expensive cars. We're seeing a lot of people who are going in with their, um, the intention of buying a fifteen to twenty thousand dollar car, who are then very effectively upsold, so that they walk out with a forty or sixty thousand dollar car that they can't um, really afford to buy after some fairly heavy sales tactics, possibly hours spent in the dealership. Um, often with add-on products as well. We're also seeing what looks like churn or upselling of people who have gone in with a car that still has finance on it and then that loan is refinanced into a new and bigger loan and then the customer walks away with a car loan that is significantly larger than the value of the car, which is a depreciating asset in the first place. Are you aware of the point of sale exemption? In the I am very aware of the point of sale exemption. We, we uh, find the point of sale exemption a, a serious concern. Um, the cars that are sold through the dealerships, there's a clear um, incentive for the people selling those cars both to get a sale and to upsell people to increase the size of the commission and to obviously earn commissions on the add-on products as well. And they don't seem to take any responsibility for the sustainability of that loan for the consumer. It's really about the sale on the day. Um, the point of sale exemption also comes up in cases we're seeing through department stores. So a lot of store credit is leading to people with unsustainable credit card debt because a lot of those those cards now just operate as a credit card like any other credit card where you can use it across a wide range of, of goods and services after the initial purchase. And commonly people go in and purchase a fairly modest item. It could be like a, a bed for $1,200 and then they walk out of there with a $16,000 credit card, a credit card limit. Um, they probably bought the bed on a you know, a generous interest-free deal, 24 to 50 months interest-free, but the actual interest rate on the card that they will revert to if they don't pay it off within that time or if they make other purchases can be 20-something percent or higher. Um, a lot of customers who've come to us in trouble have actually started out with a fairly modest purchase that has ballooned into a very big debt. Um, and the marketing by those companies to encourage people to take up that additional credit once they've been granted it is, you know, is quite effective. Are there any other issues that you'd like to refer to that you see from um, people who contact the Financial Rights Legal Centre in connection with car loans? If it assists Ms Cox, you deal with this at paragraphs 39 through to 43 of your statement. I, 
I think I've covered most of that. I, I think the only other point I would make is that the um, the oversight of the dealerships by lenders has historically seemed to be very poor. Could we move then to the issues that are reported? Oh, sorry, actually. Oh, sorry, yeah, go on. <laughs> I did just remember one thing, and that's I just wanted to emphasise it's not just the dealer finance that's the problem. Um, often there is a broker either located at the car yard or nearby or who deals with the consumer directly online involved, and those cases can be equally problematic. Um, uh, it's that type of case where we'll see something like a person will go online, put in their genuine details, such as that they're a Centrelink recipient, sole parent, um, and be approved. And then when they turn up to the dealership accompanied by the broker, there'll be a whole fake identity in terms of a job that they don't have and don't know anything about and, for, and fake pay slips that are generated by the broker and that they are reassured that this is the way it's done and it's all fine. Can I move on then to the yes. issues that the Financial Rights Legal Centre sees in relation to credit cards? What can you tell us about what consumers report to you there? Uh, credit cards is the number one cause of calls to the National Debt Helpline. In the whole time I have worked at Financial Rights Legal Centre, credit cards has been the number one issue with the exception of about three years around the global financial crisis when home loans became the biggest concern for a short time. In most of those cases, those people also had credit card debt, um, but their home loan had become their main concern. Um, we talk to consumers every day of the week who are carrying unsustainable credit card debt. It's quite frightening how much credit card debt is out there and how many people's lives are currently affected by it. Um, in terms of how people got into that position, um, we've seen a number of systemic issues over the years. The, the first issue with credit cards is that people have routinely been given additional credit in circumstances where they couldn't necessarily pay the credit they already had. Um, the way that was done is that people's eligibility for a credit limit increase was often assessed on the basis of their repayments to the existing card. Um, so if I was a good payer on my $5,000 card, I would be offered an increase to $8,000 or $10,000 or $12,000 and that could happen numerous times. Uh, sometimes I might apply for that increase, but more often than not, those increases were actually offered as almost a reward to say, you're a great payer, have a little bit more credit. Don't feel you need it now, you may as well take it just in case. So th that has the effect of putting people into the situation where they have credit limits that are way beyond what they can easily repay. Because the fact that I'm a good payer on $5,000 does not mean that I can pay $20,000. Um, and it was for a long time the common practice not to actually update people's income details to find out whether they actually had the income capacity to, to service that larger debt, let alone look at their expenses. Um, and we certainly saw cases over the years where the declared income on the initial credit card application was clearly insufficient to service the high amounts of credit that were granted. Those problems have become less in very recent years due to the responsible lending laws and ASIC. So it's become less common not to actually ask for updated income details. Um, but it was routine for a very long time and I think some providers were slower than others to take up um, to, to introduce new steps. Um, and some of the early steps they introduced included things like tick a box saying you can actually afford this, which achieved absolutely nothing, certainly didn't comply with responsible lending obligations. The other problem we see in relation to credit cards is even when a credit assessment is done, it's commonly done on the person's ability to meet the minimum repayment on the credit card and not to pay off the credit over what we would call a reasonable time. Um, if I go and purchase a pair of jeans after this hearing today, I don't want to be paying interest on them for the next 10 years. And yet we're seeing people who are carrying credit card debt for 10 years or more simply because they can't get on top of that debt. Um, if you assess people at only being able to make the minimum payment or not much above that, then that is all they'll be able to make. And if people miss payments, then there'll be significant fees added in terms of late fees and over limit fees to the point where sometimes the majority of the payment that the person is making is going towards interest and fees and they're making very little inroad into the actual debt that they owe. 
third problem that we see in that area is related to that, and that is that when someone applies for a subsequent card or a subsequent credit account of any sort, then the lender may only look at their minimum payment obligations on their existing card and treat all of the other income as available to meet the new contract, which would mean even if the first one had been assessed in a different way, they would potentially be in trouble once they had granted addition, additional credit granted. Um, another problem is that people just accumulate multiple cards, um, which can be attributable to a number of things, um, from a failure to declare the existing cards through to a failure to ask sufficient questions about them. Um, another huge problem that we've seen is in relation to people accepting balance transfer offers. So there are very attractive balance transfer offers out there, and certainly have been over recent years where people can pay 0% or something, you know, very, very low rates on their car debt if they transfer it to another provider. Um, and that offer will last for say 12 months or 18 months and then it reverts to a more standard credit interest rate. I mean one of the problems with those is we think that lenders actually compete on the teaser rates as opposed to the underlying rate in a lot of circumstances but the really big problem for the clients that we see is that they accept those offers, they transfer their debt because they see it as a lifeline to try and get on top of a debt they're not managing but they're not required to close the original card. Now they may sit on that card with the best of intentions for a year or two or even more but sooner or later something will happen in their life to create financial stress and then they will use the original card which will mean that they run up another debt and they just accumulate debts. So what was meant to be a refinance to get them out of trouble just gets them deeper and deeper into trouble. In your statement, Ms Cox, you refer to the interaction between credit card debt and home lending. Can you explain that to the Commission? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, we have seen many, many cases where consumers have refinanced their credit card debts into their home loan as a way of saving money. Um, in the short term, it's a good theory. Um, certainly people can reduce the interest payable on that amount. In the long term, they pay it off over a much longer period. Um, if they stretch it onto their entire home loan. Um, but the biggest problem is that people don't address the underlying issues um, and they may then run up further credit card debt and th that could be refinanced again to the point where the home loan itself is unsustainable. Uh, we spoke to a fellow just in the last month who had refinanced $100,000 in credit card debt onto his home loan. The home loan war had been moved to a second tier lender basically at a higher interest rate. So the result of that transaction is that what was $1,700 repayments are now $2,800 repayments and that family is very likely to lose their home because they simply can't afford it. I mean there are questions there about the responsible lending of that later transaction, um, about how someone accumulated $100,000 in credit card debts in the first place, but it's the sort of interaction between the two types of credit that we see fairly regularly. We assisted a couple a few years ago who'd actually been granted um, a credit card by the same lender who's, as they had their home loan with, which is not uncommon. Uh, they got into trouble on the credit card and it was refinanced into the home loan and then they were granted additional credit by the same lender and I think that may have happened a couple of times before we got involved and said, no, this, 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 this isn't working. We need to unpick all of this and try and get these people back to a sustainable position. Are there any other issues that you'd like to raise that you see from consumers in connection with credit cards? Surely the, uh, the amount of debt that people are carrying means that they are repaying their purchases many, many times over. So people will incur a you know, credit, they will take out a credit card, they will run it slowly over time up to the limit and then they will just sit at that limit making relatively small payments for many, many, many years. We spoke to an elderly woman recently who maintained she's been paying the same thousand dollars off since the 90s. Um, we have certainly assisted people where they're now being sued by a debt collector for a credit card debt and they're claiming, you know, 10 or 20,000 now and we look at what they initially borrowed, what they got the benefit of and how much they've paid back. You know, having used $21,000 worth of credit, 
paid back $26,000 and now being sued for yet another ten dollars or $12,000 is not uncommon. It's just very, very expensive credit when you look at it over time. It also leaves people extremely vulnerable. If I take out a personal loan and I pay it back within four to five years, then the chances that I will fall ill or lose my job in that time are a lot less than if I carry credit card debt for decades. Sooner or later, something's going to go wrong. <coughs> you refer in your statement to the use of automated systems in connection with credit cards. Can you tell us about what you see there? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, I think a huge amount of lending now is done, the, the decision making is done through automated systems. And quite often when we will get uh, someone's um, paperwork from a bank or another credit provider to look at what's happened in terms of the credit decision. There will be stuff on the face of the application that's clearly inconsistent, um, where a human, if they'd looked at it, would have raised queries and yet these things are not picked up by the automated system. I mean, a, a, an obvious example, but I know there are others. Uh, someone who has correctly stated they're on a Centrelink income, that they've correctly stated the amount, but they've ticked the wrong box as to the frequency with which they receive that income. So it looks like it's much higher. But if you were, you know, to look at it and go that they've actually said Centrelink, that's way too high. It, it's not a correct amount. So I think there are problems with using solely automated systems. Could we move on to what uh, consumers report to the Financial Rights Legal Centre in connection with insurance add-ons? You've already made some observations about what you've seen in the car loan area. What else can you tell us about what consumers report with add-on insurance issues? Well, probably the biggest thing consumers report is, that it is kind of the opposite. They don't report it at all. They don't even know they have the product. Um, so we will talk to a lot of consumers where the first they know about the add-on product is where we look into their circumstances because they're in hardship looking for options for them and go, what's this premium? <laughs> um, oh, look, you've got consumer credit insurance. Is that something you can claim on? Um, so we're seeing a lot of people who actually don't even realise they have an add-on product, which is a concern in itself. Then we see people who know they've got it but feel, felt they had no option but to purchase it. So where there were high-pressure sales tactics involved in getting them to sign up for a product um, that they weren't particularly looking for or interested in at the time. The next a lot of issues we come across, and that's often with that first group who didn't even know they had it, is when we look into it and look to see if they can make a claim. More often than not, they're not eligible to claim on the product. Um, so the reasons for that would be because they were unemployed when they got the loan in the first place, um, because they worked less than the number of hours per week that the product required you to be working in order to be able to make a successful claim. Um, a common one these days is that people are actually employed on contract rather than as full-time employees. Um, and the product will say that unless you are, if you are a contract worker, then you can't claim for unemployment at the end of that contract. Um, people are simply unaware of all those limitations. The uh, four, oh, and uh, exist, pre-existing injuries would be the other one. Um, the, the fourth area of concern is even for those people who can claim, we often find the benefits of the product are very limited. Occasionally there's a product that actually pays out the loan, and that's a great result for that person, but more often than not they only pay a fairly limited amount, you know, the minimum repayment for a certain period of time. Um, so we basically refer to it as junk insurance because the amount that is received on claims is fairly small compared to the amount that is paid in premiums by consumers across the board. In your statement and also in the evidence you've given, you've referred to high pressure sales tactics in connection with the sale of add-on insurance. Could you explain what sorts of high pressure sales tactics oh, you see? It's a range. It can be anything from just repeated phone calls. Um, trying to suggest that people need a consumer credit insurance product, that it would be responsible of them to take a consumer credit insurance product, um, to the types of scenarios we see in car yards where people are literally held for a long period of time in the place where they're signing up for the loan and placed under a lot of pressure, um, to situations where it's implied people won't get the loan if they don't agree to the product. Uh, we've even seen situations where there is a higher charge or a, a different um, uh, criteria applied where someone doesn't actually agree to purchase the product, or more subtle but very effective things where they use something like a voucher that says, oh, if you buy a couple of consumer credit products today, you'll get $500 off the premium. And uh, when people say they don't want to buy, then there's a big show of saying, oh, we're going to void your $500 voucher. And people are like, oh, 
it's $500, so I should use my $500 voucher, when in fact it's illusory. Um, it's not an amount they were intending to spend, and we would say it's not an amount that's um, worth spending. Do you see the add-on product costs built into the loan itself? The add-on cost is always financed into the loan. Um, so one of the biggest problems we're finding, particularly in the car yard market, um, is that though you know personal loans, are, it's also a problem, is that someone will go in and take out a loan and they probably could afford the loan itself for just the product they want to buy. They then sold a whole lot of supposedly risk management products, which then ironically take to the loan to the point where they can't afford the repayments. So they fall over on the loan because of the risk management products. Is there anything further that you'd like to tell the Commission about what's reported to you in connection with the sale of add-on insurance? Uh, and I'll just note for your assistance that you deal with this in paragraphs 55 to 69 of your statement. Look, I, I guess the only thing to add is that the problems with responsible lending then flow on into the add-on sales portion of those sales, particularly in the car yard markets, so that the person's ability to afford those products is not properly assessed. You, you've told us, Ms Cox, about um, what consumers report to your centre in relation to home loans, car loans, credit cards and add-on insurance products. What can you tell the Commission about the impact on consumers of those issues that are reported to you? Look, um, in terms of the add-on products, then clearly consumers are spending a lot of money on products that are of very limited value to them, and that is a worry in itself. Um, but as I've stated, often the add-on product may be the straw that broke the camel's back, and so that the people are unable to retain the car because they couldn't afford all the add-on insurance that's then financed into the loan with <coughs> interest added to it. Sorry. <coughs> Um, the result of that, coupled with problems with responsible lending in the car um, loan market, is simply that people who purchase a car often need that car. They need it to go to work. They need it to take kids around. Sometimes they have disabled kids or other dependents that they need to transport around. And buying a car that they can't actually afford and retain means that they then lose that car and they are back into the same position they were of being stuck without transport but with an enormous cost because quite often where cars are repossessed they're sold and there is a significant residual debt which just adds stress. Um, in the uh, home loan market obviously a poor uh, choice of home loan um, can cost people tens of thousands of dollars over the life of the loan. Now that is money that could otherwise be spent on a better lifestyle, on better um, savings, on investment for the future and pursuing other goals. In circumstances where people end up with home loans they really can't afford um, in the long term or particularly where they refinance or consolidate debts into their home loan and they ultimately lose the house. That is not only financially costly but heartbreaking for the people involved. Some people are sanguine can actually, you know, look at it as simply money and maybe, you know, they can pick up the pieces and start again. But for a lot of the people that we talk to, the loss of their home is very uh, closely tied to family memories and aspirations and to their total sense of self-worth. So they see that as a major personal failure. Not, and, and it's very, very um, disruptive to family life, often can mean moving to different suburbs or even out of town. Some people who've had home loans for a very long time who then get into trouble, particularly after some sort of debt consolidation, will find they can't even rent for the same price as they were paying under the mortgage. So they may become homeless or forced to relocate into other regional locations. In um, the credit card market, 
Uh, that's where we see, I think, the most insidious effects because it's a very long-term drain on people's finances. The credit card may initially allow people to consume um, consumer goods, uh, but in the long run it has precisely the opposite effect because people end up with all their money going towards interest and fees. They have very little left for essential living expenses, for savings, it's out of the question. Um, certainly building resilience to be able to meet unexpected fence, um, expenses in the future becomes more difficult because of that debt that they're carrying. Um, in some cases, people end up bankrupt, um, which for some people is not an enormous thing. For, for others, it's huge. Um, and when you lose your home and all the equity that you've accumulated in it through bankruptcy over a credit card that may have begun as a very small purchase, it's a, a very sad situation to observe. The financial impacts are huge, but the non-financial impacts are possibly even worse. Um, so people who are in long-term um, unsustainable debt experience stress. That stress then causes them to have physical ailments, um, to, to get sick. It causes strain on relationships. It causes family breakdown. It causes loss of practice productivity, it actually causes people to have deteriorating ability to make complex decisions um, because their um, thinking capacity is literally absorbed by dealing with the day-to-day -day stress of, of the debt. Um, in some cases we see that people either um, acquire or exacerbate mental illness um, as a result of dealing with debt and suicide is threatened and occasionally people actually do commit suicide over their debts. So the non-financial impacts are absolutely enormous. Thank you, Ms Cox. Those are the questions we have for Ms Cox, Your Commissioner. Before I adjourn, <coughs> does any party having leave to appear seek leave to cross-examine Ms Cox? Then thank you, Ms Cox, for your evidence. It's been very helpful. Uh, you're excused further attendance. I'll adjourn until two o'clock and we'll begin then uh, with the uh, witness from NAB, is that right? Yes, that Ms. is, Commissioner. Yes, two o'clock.